Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Amazing. They're pretty amazing. Tough cookies. Yes, this is the, the, the toughest, most tenacious, fearless animal on the planet. Yes. I, I, I would... What can they teach us? They, reading the stories on these, these guys is hilarious. Like, they pick fights with everything. I even read them picking fights with rhinos and elephants. Oh, yes. Yes, it's been documented. <laughs> and lions. Like, it's like an elephant just squish them, but they probably... Many species are in crisis and need your help. They're doing okay. Yep, yep. The population's uh, in decline, like most mammals. It's trending downwards, yeah. uh, but right now the um, IUCN mm. is uh, least concerned right. about them. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. All right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Angie. Angie, I am like so fired up again today. I'm just really fired up. <laughs> oh, this is a fun one. Yeah, okay. I'm not fired up over anything bad. I'm fired up about the animal we're talking about today, and that's the honey badger. Yeah, I'm more just happy. I giggled yeah. a lot. Yeah. This... I giggled a lot uh, reading and discussing this honey badger with you. These guys, I... <laughs> I love them. It's like one of my top five. I, you know, elephants are my babies and horses are up there. These guys are just, anytime I see anything about them, I just crack up. I was never drawn to them. I never worked with a species like them or anything. Um, but I, I have to say I have a newfound respect for them because yeah. they are amazing. They're pretty amazing. Tough cookies. Yes. This is the, the, the toughest, most tenacious, fearless animal on the planet. Yes. I, I, I would, I, I want someone to find me another animal that's as rough and tough as these guys. Well, it's inner. I don't have any experience with them, and I always like to joke that, and it's not really a joke. But when during my uh, tenure at the zoo, out of all the animals I worked with, the one that I was probably the most fearful of was the male rooster. Yeah. <laughs> and I ran from him a few times, and I'm not even kidding. Out of, and so, nice. and I always joked, I was like, if he, you know, if he ends up killing me, throw me in, throw me in the pit with something else to look a little more tough than that. Uh, but, but I have to say that this uh, honey badger was, is much more scary than yeah. yes, a male very rooster. Much so. a male rooster. And it's like, you know, we're sitting here talking about how smart animals are, and then you wonder about chickens, you're like, they're much up there. Hey, <laughs> they're, now, they're, smart. They're, they're, pretty smart. I, they're they're definitely trainable. Yes, so, that's true. You know, yeah. they like treats, so that's oh fun. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Yeah, so the the honey badger, I just I look at pictures of these guys and it just they just crack me up. So, you know, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna have a lot of fun talking about these uh, special animals today. And hopefully, you're gonna learn a lot. I know I yeah. did. Oh yeah, of course. Like, like I said, newfound appreciation right. about physiology mm -hmm. and evolution. No, yeah, it's so fun to. And again, that's why you know, last you and I last week were talking about our last episode, talking about being kids and learning all this new stuff. And it was it's fun to to be able to focus on an animal and go, okay, yeah, what, what can we what can we cover in an hour? You know, what are some of the hot the hot topics that we should talk about with these these guys? And we will cover them all today. I, I think with the honey badger, if if nobody's ever seen one, they need to Google or look at one. I mean, obviously in the in the show episode, we'll have a picture of a honey badger up. But just to just to give you an idea, if if you're just listening and, and you don't have an idea what they look like, they're about a medium sized dog, smaller dog, forty to fifty pounds. Yeah, they're yeah twenty five to thirty five, okay. not quite that big. See, in my mind, they're already big. I know, and scary. I know. You think they're huge and scary, <laughs> but they're actually not that big. And for an animal that almost dominates Africa because nobody really messes with it. They're, they're not that big. So they're 13, 14 kilograms. So you got to throw in the metric. They stand only about 10 inches at the shoulder. So not even a foot tall, mm -hmm. but long, length, they're about two, two and a half feet or 60 centimeters. So again, not huge. Not huge. No. They're not huge. They look big on film, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah, <do>. maybe. <laughs> but they're, they're, you know, they're like saying they're not big, but they're big in attitude. Huge. That is where these Huge. these animals stand out. Like nothing really messes with them, and they kind of look like I don't know, like when the the patterning, and it makes sense because they're related to skunks, and we'll get into the lineages. But they have a a top white coat with some gray and black hairs in there, but it's mainly white around the crown. So it kind of stretches to their eyebrows back. So they have this white all the way down, and then over their tail, and then. Their uh, sides are sometimes white, light white, and then black underneath. Now, that's going to vary on the species, too. But typically, when we see honey badgers, white on top, black underneath is, is, is what we see. So that's kind of giving you a, a, a visual of them. 
they reading the stories on these these guys is hilarious. Like they pick fights with everything. I even read them picking fights with rhinos and elephants. Oh yes, yes, it's been documented. <laughs> it's and lions. Like, it's like an elephant just squish them, but they probably run because they're like, I'm not going to mess with this thing. I think the animals all understand that this yeah. thing is not to, to be, be messed, messed with. with. Yeah, they're they're pretty bad. Um, some of the cool stuff that we're going to cover is is they're impervious to venomous snakes. Yes, that is yeah. something that I learned and was so fascinated being the physio- mm. physiology dork that I am. I instantly, you know, had to find out how. How yeah. can they eat a king cobra, right. one of the most poisonous yeah. snakes in the world? Right. And the worst case scenario, as they're chowing down on it, they might pass out for a couple hours, mm-hmm. like a little cat they nap. They sleep it off, yeah. They sleep it off. And then they pop right back up and keep eating it. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, Unbelievable. I, reading stuff that arrows can't pierce their skin. No. Nope. Machetes can't pierce nope. their skin. I mean, obviously guns could, which is horrible to think about. But like bees, no problem. Yeah, you they know? bring it on. Yeah, bees. What, and we'll talk about how they earn their name, Honey Badger. And what's also amazing about these guys that I, that I really loved learning about this week is how smart they are. And I thought it played well into what you and I have been talking about the last few weeks. Sure. Or episodes as far as how intelligent creatures really are. And I know dolphins are up there, but man, these honey badgers must be not far behind. Well, they're doing pretty well for themselves. And yeah. they've, uh, they've figured out how to get along in this modern day society right. for the most part and do really well. And be, you know, not necessarily notoriously the king of the jungle, but... Kind of the, the prince of the yeah, jungle. They're, I mean, lions don't mess with them. They they chase off lions. The I, every anybody listening to this episode and you really want to learn more, I promise you is is well worth the hour of your life. But go Google honey badger mayhem and watch that hour video. It is. I was dying laughing. It was yeah, I, hilarious. I didn't watch the hour long video, but it, some of some of the outtakes and um, of course the uh, the the viral video, right. the crazy right. nasty ass honey badger one. Yeah, it's from 2011, <laughs> which was overdubbed. Yeah, so funny. I mean, I was cracking up, and then just not even watching videos, just reading right. some of the stuff and some and of the comments do. that people make uh, that have worked with them and the researchers that have been studying them in Africa. And, uh, right. yeah, they're just, they're, just, they're little balls of personality. They Let's are. put it they that are. way. They are. That's what they're great. And so the, my favorite honey badger on earth was, is this honey badger called Stoffel. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a funny name. Yeah. And he's in Honey Badger Mayhem, the star of Honey Badger Mayhem. His owner, and it's funny because reading a paper this week, one of the first things they quoted from a paper published in 1900, you know, Natural World, it was, you know, honey badgers make great pets. They're wonderful, really? you know, entertaining animals. Yes. And then I watched this video and the and the owner who he rescued Stoffel. So Stoffel was someone's pet. Couldn't take care of it, obviously. Surprisingly. So yeah. took him to this this rescue rehabilitation center and this this guy adopted it. He's like, okay, I'll take care of him. He calls Stoffel the pet from hell. <laughs> and the oh my god, it just I'll quickly recap. There's gonna be a lot of giggles in this I know, episode, guys. Uh. It's it's a story worth telling is the first enclosure he had, he, he then he got Stoffel a girlfriend, thinking that would kind of chill him out. And it was Hammy, was his girlfriend. Well, that didn't. So him and Hammy and, and Stoffel were just two peas in a pod, and they just wrecked havoc. Oh, I couldn't imagine. So Double in, trouble. Yes, totally. So in the video that shows them, Hammy and Stoffel working together, they, he had these double locks, latches. And it was like Stoffel was on the bottom, like pushing just right. And it was like... Meh, 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 meh. And Hammy was climbing, and it was almost like Stoffel was telling him, okay, get that lock. And then it was like, bah, 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 and then go up and get the other lock. And they worked together to open this this gate to escape. So teamwork. Yes, teamwork. And then, I mean, so that level of intelligence to sure, do that. Sure, that's pretty high high up there. Then he just was like, fine, I'm going to build you this enclosure and stick you in here, you know, with these straight walls and everything. So he builds this enclosure, and, and you know, being an ex-zookeeper, you kind of probably uh, can understand this. You know, looking at the trees, there was trees kind of here, you know, near the ledge, which was dumb because animals climb and Stoffel climbed right up, <laughs> broke a branch down and climbed right out. That was easy. So then he, the, this owner's like, fine, takes out all the trees. Stoffel went and dug up huge rocks. Yeah, they're big time diggers. Big, big diggers, but dug up all these big rocks and rolled them over to the edge and built himself a little ledge and jumped out. Really? <laughs> yes. So then he's like, fine, fine, Stoffel. I'm taking all the rocks out. Digs out all the rocks. And Stoffel's like, fine. 
So Stoffel w- started rolling mud balls and made this mud ball wall. Oh my and word. jumped out. <laughs> This guy wakes up in the middle of the night thinking they're getting broken into. And it's, it's Stoffel who, would, they're like, when he breaks into the house, you just let him do his thing because you cannot stop him or you're going to die. Oh, my you word. Know? And it's just like, oh, the owner and his wife, they're like, Stoffel. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like... Oh, I would love one as a pet, but no, thank you. No, thank yeah, you. No, thank you. Not no. not a not a proper pet, but Mr. Stoffel and, and his girlfriend Hammy are just oh my god, it was just so funny. Wrecking mayhem. Yeah, so he finally just put in an electric fence at the top, and that now Stoffel hates him. He's like Stoffel hates me because I because he, <laughs> he finally outsmarted yes. him finally. It yeah, was- but he told us a couple stories about how Stoffel dug out and went and harassed the lions. Round one went to the Lions, like Stoffel mauled him. Round two went to the Lions, Stoffel almost got killed. Sure, sure. So yeah. he was like, I got to say, you know, I got to protect this animal and all my other animals. So the uh, the rambunctious honey badger, where, where are they from? And where are they, you know, where are they ranging today? I, I, I guess I could put up front that conservation status, you know, I know we're going to kind of cover it at the end, but they're doing okay. Yep, yep. The population's uh- in decline. Like most mammals. It's trending downwards, yeah. uh, but right now the um, IUCN mm-hmm. is uh, least concerned right. about them. Right, so they're not... But it should be noted that they're, they are a hard population to, to tag right. and study because of their very large home ranges, mm-hmm. especially for males. Yeah, huge. And also they're often nocturnal. nocturnal. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do have some diurnal patterns. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so they're... The counts they have, they don't know how representative that is. Right, so. right. So it's kind of hard to an animal study, but they think they're doing okay. Yeah. But still in decline. Right. And like, populations yeah. are fragmented, of course, right. because of people right. living places and, and life. And fences. I mean, mm-hmm. they can probably get through some fences. But but I didn't know this. I thought, you know, when I thought honey badger, I thought sub saharan Africa, you know, below the Congo. I didn't realize they ranged up all the way up into almost northern Africa and then over into Arabia, up into like Turk. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tur- Turkmenistan, India? Yeah, Chris, that was really fascinating to me, too. I, yeah. I just assumed Africa right, or, right. you know, central, southern Africa. and But it just goes to show how, how they're able to adapt to their environment and how mm-hmm. tough they are. You want me to live in a desert? Fine. You want yeah. me to live in a mountain? Fine. You want me yeah. to live in the forest? Yeah. Fine. Yeah, they, they live you know, in everything. They can handle it, yeah. and yeah. which is probably one of the reasons why they have been able to do okay so right. far. Right, and not be, you know, totally decimated. They, yeah, but like you said, they're, if you look at their current versus old habitat, that definitely there's some fragmentation there, mm-hmm. especially in Arabia, where like, in, I read some studies like in Jordan and Yemen and, and that part of the world, you know, they're kind of, uh, the populations are fragmented, but still doing okay in Africa, it, it seems like. So Chris, speaking of their native range, right. an interesting story that I came across was that honey badgers have been spotted in Iraq. Oh, yeah. There's actually stories of them wrecking habit there and potentially being having man-eating badgers. And a lot of that's been yeah. exaggerated yeah, right, and whatnot. Right, right. But in the mid-2000s during the British occupation, and they were basically, the locals uh, were basically charging the troops with bringing them in. Oh, bringing the honey badgers <laughs> yeah. in. Yeah, <laughs> bringing them in to cause... You know, yeah, kind of mayhem, right? <laughs> Which is unfortunately what they do. But of course, uh, you know, the, the British soldiers denied it. And to this day, it's never really been proven. Right. But what researchers and scientists, of course, this gained some popular press back mm-hmm. in the day. Well, researchers pretty much proved that they were just so versatile that they're able, they were able to, you know, not only be in Africa and like you said, parts mm-hmm. of Asia, that they could, they could travel into this desert area and right. do just fine. Right, right. So we may never know the truth about uh, that as a, as a, you know, as well, a it's strategy, like but. I read a lot of this stuff and made me think about raccoons, mm-hmm. you know, in, in North America and how they survive. And when I lived in San Francisco in the city, I was in the big city a long time ago, past life. And one night I wake up and I hear something in the backyard and I look out and there was a family of raccoons oh, absolutely. rummaging through my dog food. I'm like, a whole family of raccoons in the middle of the city. I was astonished. I was mm-hmm. like, how do they survive in this city, you know, with all just homes and buildings and you stuff? you kidding me? They do great in the city. Yeah. They can go gar- dumpster diving. Right, right. <laughs> so I was very surprised, yeah. you know, way back in my early 20s. So the honey badger is part of this mustelid or mustelay family. And what's interesting about them is a lot of physiologists or naturalists think they're more related to weasels than they are actual badgers. Yes, that's what was my understanding of mm-hmm. it, which we think of we have you know badgers 
here in North America. Mm. And but yes, looking more at their physiology mm-hmm. and, and their structures. That yeah, they're clo- they're yeah. more like a weasel or mm-hmm. a ferret, mm-hmm. more so than a badger. But I think the naturalists in the the late 1700s, when they started describing the, all these species. That they saw, oh, it looks like a badger, so it became a, a badger. Right. When actually, in actuality, it, it's not. But it's Melivora capensis. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm practicing. That sounds night. really good. <laughs> Where's our capensis. clap button? Clap, yeah. clap, clap. The, uh, so yeah, I just practiced that all night. So uh, of the honey badger, so that's a honey badger scientific name. Of them, there's about 10 subspecies and not a lot of differences. But what was cool, though, I did read the one in Congo, which is Weird, because I would have thought maybe the ones in India or something would be different coloration. The ones in the Congo are almost full black. There's hmm. really no white in there. So that that subspecies in that part of Africa. So I don't know, more of the rainforest. Jungle, maybe. Right, right. Yeah. They're more black. The ones that live in Nepal, you know, as far as away as that, in the mountainous regions, they have like a thicker undercoat, more woolly. For the cold weather. Right. They, they To survive that. But other than that, not a huge amount of differences physiology-wise. And then the this family of mustelids is our badgers, weasels, otters, mm-hmm. the martens, the minks, and then the wolverines. Well, another one that we always kind of forget about. And I was like, oh, we have to do an episode on wolverines at some point. In Absolutely. Next, next couple um, years. Yeah, you are a Michigan girl, so. Well, and my Michigan heritage. Yeah, your Michigan state. So um, yeah. yeah, so the the I can't say that I love the Wolverines because right. that's the University of Michigan. Michigan right. I I'm an ag girl. Mm. I was Michigan State and we're the Spartans. Right, right. However, Wolverines are tough and they are cool. Um, I don't believe there's any in Michigan anymore though. Just right, unfortunately, just up and got pushed out mm-hmm. and up in Canada maybe. Mm. But they're very tough. <laughs> right, right. That's what I thought of when I was thinking about honey badgers. I was like Wolverines. Oh yeah, you know, really tough oh, yeah. animals. Although I think Michigan State did beat Michigan yeah. this year, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, go green. <laughs> yeah, go, there you go. The so this pretty big family. It's you know all different. The skunks are part of this too, and then the hunting badger is just its own subfamily. Okay, so it's not part of a badger family or a weasel family or anything like that. It's just its, it's own, own lineage, right? Own genus. Mm-hmm. Wolverines are own genus too. So so pretty interesting. Going back to evolution, I don't know how much of this is interesting to, to listeners or not. You know, again, that, that big explosion 50 million years ago. The, the interesting part about this, though, was they, they, the mustelids are the largest family in carnivoria or carnivores, basically okay. carnivores. Even though honey badgers are omnivores, the carnivore family, they're, they're wrapped into that. They're actually the most diverse of any, which, was, which I thought was pretty interesting. They can all trace back their their long distance relatives to this thing that was called a, a myocid. It was just a really weird looking animal that was like cat like, bear like, hyena like is how I science fiction like. Right. Like just really, <laughs> really funky looking. So the, the myocids about fifty million years ago was old world, you know, Asia, Europe that they evolved in. And then the mustelids, and again, not like Horses or some of these other species where we have a lot of evolutionary history. Not a lot on these guys. They can't, with as far as going hunting badger, there's five phases. So, second phase is where they start to diversify about 11 million years ago. So, this is where the first otters and badgers. Okay, so, up. similar in size. Right. No giant. No. There's just a that. bigger one that's okay. coming up, but not huge. Not mm-hmm. like these massive saber toothed cats that are like as big as a horse. Right. Third phase starts slowing down as far as the diversification up to about 5 million years ago. Then the fourth phase where we really had a lot of climate change. It was interesting reading about this too, that it was actually two to three degrees C warmer, Uh but less carbon in the atmosphere. So that's like what we're battling now. That's what's causing the earth to get warmer. Whereas it is normal for the earth to get warmer, just not under these conditions. With this much carbon in there. Right. That we're actually causing it. It's not a natural cycle gradual cycle it's a rapid warming of the earth because we've dumped so much carbon in the atmosphere anyways that was kind of cool that there was there was some some changes there where they start to diversify again and this is where we see like the honey badger emerging about three million years ago and then during the ice age ten thousand years ago Mm -hmm. is when they uh they they finally were were kind of finalized now you were talking about the the large Honey badger or large mustelid. There In was, my mind, there's, it's large. Yeah. So <laughs> there was this wolverine or weasel type thing called a megalictus. 
And it's about a very large dog, about a 130 pound dog or 60 mm-hmm. kilogram was about the size. So, you know, pretty big. Like a Newfoundland or yeah, something. Yeah, but if a honey badger was that big, oh my God, I would die. Run. But yeah, like I was joking about bull sharks. No, these guys would tear your face off quick. <laughs> well, actually, well, and I'm sure we'll get to that. They don't usually go for the face. No, we'll get to that. <laughs> yes, here pretty quick. You want to tune into that one because, they, oh my God, my legs hurt. Um, so, you know... It, just some mitochondrial DNA stuff. They've traced these guys, and they are related to uh, the American badger, European Asian badger, and and the others, the weasels and things like that. So this is where we get get all that stuff. But I do know, you know, throughout their history, they they there's been conflict with people. Oh, absolutely. And I and I was able to dive into their history with humans a little mm-hmm. bit. And quite honestly, with a lot of these other more um, potentially like common species that Chris and I have covered, there's always you know, either folklore, cave paintings, mm-hmm, or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And and with the honey badger, per se, uh, there wasn't too, too much that I readily found about us worshiping them and right. loving them and all of this and that. Obviously, they're a symbol of strength and toughness, or, you know, like we mentioned earlier with the Wolverines, University of Michigan, there's symbols here and there. Mm-hmm. But their history with humans pretty much at least from what i could find is usually there's you know there's been some conflict mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. they they aren't really good pets yeah. and they're not super soft and fluffy yeah. and friendly and yeah. so and they're tough as nails they're more pests mm-hmm, they're yeah. more pests and right. that's a great way to describe it because of course they are aggressive and do all these things mm-hmm. but they're a big pest especially in some of these underdeveloped countries mm-hmm. when it comes to Poultry and mm-hmm. then apiculture, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, apiculture is just a fancy word to say beekeeper. Yeah, honeybees. Yeah. Honeybees. And so those those are where we see a lot more. And so just to jump in real quick, the honeybees is what I said in the, in the past episode when my wife was traveling around. She went the entire uh, circle of South Africa checking out with doing a honeybee research project for two weeks and she said that the beekeepers the the headache for them was honey badgers yes that they just come in and destroy hives each hive's worth about a thousand rand and in in the united states for us you know honeybee hives when we kept some were about we sold ours for 250 dollars a pop Mm -hmm. so they're worth quite a bit per hive so when you have this honey badger coming in and instances of destroying 60 hives in one night to not just get at the honey, but they like when we get to nutrition, they like to eat the larva. Right, that's, that's really what they're the protein they're going for. Right, so it really, you know, it, it's it's a lot of headaches for the beekeepers. Lots there. of headaches, and the same thing for poultry, mm. right? Um, a lot of people, yeah, chickens and, and, and chickens. Maybe that rooster that you loved so much, <laughs> you could sacrifice. Right. Oh yeah, they <laughs> he would not win against a honey badger. No. <laughs> uh, and so there's so there's there's definitely like more conflict with that, and they, I think, unfortunately or rightfully so perhaps, get this notorious, you know, that they're a pest mm-hmm, and that they're mm-hmm. a nuisance and that they perhaps either need to be done away with or eradicated or, or, eradicated yeah. or um, poisoned. And mm-hmm. we'll talk a lot more about that later on. That's historically how it's been. There's lots of, there's good news on the on the front to report with bees as far as non-governmental groups working with the locals mm-hmm. and teaching them how to basically badger proof their they're, so they're Stoffel, hives. so Stoffel. Okay, and I was going to get this to maybe. Uh, to, sorry, not to take away some of your thunder in the behavior, but <laughs> no, no, please do. So there's this gentleman in Mr. Guy Stubbs. This guy is a, a saint. I, like I, I would love to meet him. He was trying in, in part of the the honey badger mayhem video. He was making these honey proof or you know honey proof hive or mm-hmm. honey badger proof hives. Mm-hmm. So his first experiment, he stuck this hive on top of this tree with no bark. To see how the badger would overcome it. Because they're great climbers. Easy. Climbed right up it. Stoffel's oh, yeah. like... They were no, laughing. Well, I mean, he, Stoffel, I think, is a little overweight because he was like... <laughs> after climbing up, but he did. He got up there. No problem. His claws got into the, the knots and stuff of the tree. So he's like, okay. And he was just kind of doing a test to see. He didn't expect much. But then his next experiment was this large table with these you know straight legs. And he's like, there's no way they can climb up it. And so Hammy and Stoffel tried to, to climb. And finally, I think it was Hammy. She, she found like little knots where the tables connect. And she was able to grab on that with a claw and pull herself up. 
And the next thing she knows, she's up there and, and guys are like, oh my God, what am I going to do with these guys? Oh my word. So, yeah, they are <laughs> yeah, incredible. They're, yeah, they're definitely um, a force to be reckoned mm-hmm. with. And that's, you know, that's what these local farmers, mm-hmm. and I'm a little bit more familiar with in, in South Africa, that that's what they're they're dealing with, the farmers and the apiculture. So, but I think what's happened more recently in 2011, I briefly mentioned, instead of kind of being this pest, their their nastiness or and their amazing physiology mm-hmm. and their toughness was showcased in a documentary, mm-hmm. but then spliced and dubbed into yeah. this crazy nasty ass honey badger yeah. video. <laughs> I could have watched it. And since we're done. it's so funny, guys. If you if you've never seen it, go to it. You probably have seen it because it has over eighty million views. Yeah, yeah. or more, <laughs> and growing. And so I think it's given people a little bit more. I lo- I like the spin on it because it shows that they are tough right, and they right, are intelligent right. and but that's not necessarily a bad thing right. you know we should we should love diversity things right. that are different than us i mean right. the fact that you know a, you know a lion tries to gr- grab them and their neck's so loose and their yeah. skin's so loose like it doesn't penetrate their skin right. so there's some really cool physiology going on there and i think it's given people new respect because now if you just Google the honey badger. Right. There's, you know, a lot more sites talking right. about their physiology right. and and kind of, you know, holding a trophy to the fact that they are so Tough. Nasty, nasty ass and badass. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's really cool. And I think that's where you got to love like the social media and kind of comedy mm-hmm. and, um, you know, edutainment or right, you know, education right. and entertainment mixed right. together. And, and now people are trying to meet in the middle, I think, at least some of the research I did in mm-hmm. South Africa of trying to... Okay, we don't want to, you know, poisoning in them has been a very common way to Mm -hmm. deal with them, but they're trying to think outside the box of how we can work and live alongside them. Right, and not just kill them. Mm -hmm. Not just kill them. And and that's kind of part of that documentary that made me think, and and Angie alluded to it earlier, was a farmer, pig farmer, who called out, uh, he trapped one instead Mm -hmm. of just killing it, he he trapped it and called out the uh, the rescue guy to come out and get it. And so, and he said... You better watch out because those things will go straight for your bleep and nuts. <laughs> yes. So this is what you're Cajones, losing. testicles, yes. whatever you want to call them. They, if you are a male and you see a honey badger, run. run. I mean, even female, I would run too, but run and don't run till you die because if they get a hold of you, they yeah, go, don't drop, don't fall down. Yeah, they go for the nuts and they tear them out. And, you know, again, getting a little bit before the nutrition, there have been documentation. Of Cape Buffalo ripping the testicles off, which of Cape is Buffalo. one of the big five in Africa, huge. huge. And so, Cape Buffalo. For those of you that don't know, I'm hopefully we'll get to cover it because it's a really cool big five animal in Africa. Is they have horns, and each horn weighs about 25 pounds. 25 pounds. So their racks about 50 pounds. About 50 pound rack. Yeah. And like you said, the honey bulls bit. are like two or three thousand pounds, probably four thousand pounds, and then they're a force to be reckoned right. with themselves. And so you're telling me that a honey badger, twenty five, was... thirty five pound honey badger, running up, ripping off the nuts, oh my, of the testicles <laughs> of a big bull. <laughs> it's so just, ridiculous. It's just, and then waiting for that guy to die and bleed out like horrible, <sighs> painful death, <sighs> and then go eat it or try to eat it. I, I shouldn't be laughing, oh, no. but it's just, I it's mean, ridiculous. So if you're a, a male, just run. Well, isn't there um, some do- a documentation of some of the researchers? I was came across said when they're filming them and trying to get oh. some of their natural wildlife behaviors that they actually wear cups yeah, yeah like they, jock they, strap they, yeah oh god i would yeah i would have a cage around me yeah like i would be in full metal armor it's like, like it's, yeah it's, it's one of those decisions so if my job requires me to wear a cup and i'm not a sports athlete <laughs> maybe i want to think again about my job it's like i I really will love these guys. Like I said, the pet from hell. No, thank you. I don't Ooh. want something that will rip my nuts off. No, <laughs> Just, gosh. Oh, my God. These guys are too much. Yeah, so wildlife uh, photographers wear cups when they cover them because it, it, they they are dangerous. They are no joke. Yeah. Um, so some of the physical traits of these guys, their nose, they, they smell. So, you know, again, being a physiologist, and we kind of understand how some of this works, but they almost have the, as good of smelling as dogs. Wow. As they, they really can. So that's one of the things they do is they go, they, they dig a lot, burrow a lot. Right, because they can smell into the smell ground, the, the smell out. Stuff. Yeah. Right. They, they eat Lizards, everything. scorpions, cobras. So, right. Yeah. And, and I thought it would be interesting just kind of really quick. Why do they, how could, so sense of smell. 
you know, physiology wise, why do animals have a better sense of smell than us? And we have a good sense of smell. We just not as good as a, say a beagle or a hound dog, a bloodhound. Not or something even close. Like that. Right. right. And it just has to do with receptors in the top of your nose. When an odor comes in, binds to a receptor and, you know, I'm starting to think because we do talk about receptors in other episodes. I always like to describe a receptor as a lock and key. Yeah, I think it's a great right? description. So you stick the key in the lock and turn it. It turns the receptor on. So a certain smell will bind to a certain receptor. That signals the brain. The right, brain and interprets. Yeah, there's like downstream eff- effects, effects from that. Right, the from cascade. That, then I right. think of a waterfall, like a cascade. One thing goes to another, goes to another, goes to another until... Yeah, the brain, however the brain works, which we still don't know, mm-hmm. miracle it, how it works, but that it interprets the smells. And so different receptors work in combination with taste, you know, for things that are sweet or sour mm-hmm. or, or really nasty t- smelling or, or whatnot. That's kind of just the basics of how smell works. So they have more receptors. Much, much more. So receptors they have is like 300 million versus a human who only has like 6 million. Oh, wow. So, so a, ton. a lot more. Yeah, a lot more. A lot more. like 50 times more. So their nose is much, much more sensitive. Mm-hmm. And so they they can pick up odors that we, we couldn't. Right, because as much as I try, I cannot sniff that gecko out of the ground. No, no, but they can. They <laughs> I can. can't even figure out what in my car yeah. smells like a dye. Yeah. And it's probably an old milk bottle yeah. or a Cheerio or who even knows what. <laughs> you don't kids, know guys. Yeah, yeah, aye, aye, aye. Things just fall, you know, they fall If you hands. have young kids, you know, your life will stink yeah, sometimes. You know, you know. <laughs> now, you said about their skin, and this is what's really cool their physiology that they can turn their whole body in their skin right it's so loose so yeah. when a predator grabs them by the skin which there's video of if right. you look online yeah and see that and they can turn and bite the face mm-hmm. and that's what they do they bite and scratch the face and they'll destroy the face of the predator so that's why predators are scared to death of them like yeah, and the skin is really loose, so for an animal to try to grip them and then puncture, right, is right. what yeah. the lion would be trying to do is very, very hard. And mm-hmm. that's why the, the folklore that a machete can't pierce mm-hmm. them or arrows a dart or right. arrows is holds true because right. it's just the skin is so loose, it kind of just bounces off. Right, and that's probably why Stoffel lived through the second round with the lions sure. because it, it, I, he did get some wounds, but it mm-hmm. wasn't fatal like it should have been. Mm-hmm. A 30 pound. Badger. Well, Sofal's probably like 50 pounds because he looked a little heavy for <laughs> Badger. So, yeah. So, that is one of the cool things physiology-wise is that they can just turn in their skin, you know. And, yeah, you got a hold of me, but your face is gone. Right. And so, that's why they, they really don't mess with them. Very sharp teeth. You know, mm-hmm. again, kind of They're carnivores. carnivores. Yeah. Big canines. So, yep. Yeah, strong jaws and then these long claws that are, that are really good for digging. And uh, climbing. Things like that. Right. And then climbing. Yeah. So, I talked about... You know, Stoffel and his, his ability to uh, to grip and climb, that they can do that. And then, this is, I didn't know this either. They, they have an anal pouch, like a skunk. Okay. The, yeah, the anal stuff, yeah. the, the anal, I mean, I, I always laugh at yeah. stuff to do with butts and, butts. you know, and poop. And, <laughs> yeah. and I love poop. I study poop a lot. Uh, but yeah, this I, this was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah that they, they're like skunks. Right. And um, it's supposed to be horrendous. Well, that's the know? thing. They, I mean, the, 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 the smell is supposed to be some of the, the worst you've ever smelled, which yeah. just being a curious scientist, I kind of want to smell it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like right. A small part of me is like, well, how bad? I mean, we, I know a skunk smell. Right. I know lots of really bad smells. Rotten milk, you know. Right. I know bad right. smells. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, how bad can this be? But it's supposed to be... Very, yeah, very. Probably make you vomit. Right. It's bad. It didn't, you know, it's like, you know, keeps predators away. So that's one of their defense mechanisms is, hey, you're going to make me mad. Here you go. Smell this. Oh, you're going to bite me? Okay, I'll tear your face off. Right. Oh, if you're a male, don't turn around because you're going to lose your nuts. So yeah, these they've guys, got a lot going on yeah, to, uh, to just, keep people away. They're, they're crazy. And then one of the, the last things is, uh, you know, listen, we did the poison dart frogs. We talked about aposomatic because I was like, well, they don't have a, a coat pattern that uh, camouflage. So like skunks, their white back with black Mm -hmm. undercoat is a warning. It's coloration. Hey, don't mess with me or you're in a world of hurt. And you and if you've ever been skunked, you remember that. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I'm not gonna mess with that thing with uh, a white stripe down its back. Now in the wild they they do live hard lives and there there inst- there are instances of predators killing them. There are, yes. Yeah. So it doesn't mean they're impervious. They, but they're usually they go after cubs, the little right, ones. The little ones. Mm-hmm. They they're not invincible. But so they only live to be about seven in the wild, which isn't very long, no. which, which is kinda sad. 
Because yeah. they, they, again, when we get to generation interval, it's not short no. like others. But in captivity, they can live up to be 30. Mm-hmm. In defense of zoos or going back to, we talk about what zoos do a good job of. You know, these animals are, are very well taken care of. They're provided all their food, free medical, free dental, all that stuff. So, you know, chalk one up for, for benefits of living in a zoo that they can live up to 30 yeah. years. I have not seen honey badger in captivity, so I don't know how common these guys are. Yeah, I haven't either, Chris. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're not Aren't, there, yeah. right? But just in general, off the top of my head, I right. I can't say that uh, I know. And they're not a species in peril, so it's not like we really need to keep. Right, them and that's in something to the right. listeners, you know, that are just joining us. Yeah. A lot of the a lot of a lot of the species in zoos are often in peril, in yeah. peril, yeah, in trouble, or yeah. you know, endangered. Um, close to extinction, things like that, so the zoos can keep a genetic bank mm-hmm. and help breed them. And so, a lot of times, there's no if there's no need to showcase a species, let alone in North America that lives right. in Africa right. or Asia, right. then then there's just no you know we could we could use a North American badger, and we could use the money, and I mean mm-hmm. use the money in the space because zoos don't have a lot of space, don't have a lot of exactly. Money. They'd rather to, focus on species that, that need it, the need to right. be to need to be saved, and that's. A big change in zoos in, mm-hmm. in the last 20 years. Of you know, course. 30 years. Yeah. Where zoos were like, oh, let's have a cool collection to get people in here. It's more of, hey, we have a cool collection, but, you know, really behind the scenes, we're trying to save this this animal and this species. Right. And this is, yeah, the collections are a lot more thought out long term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. what's important. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, the, some of the sad stuff is the cubs, half the cubs die before reaching maturity. So again, a hard life. And, this was hilarious. Was it the I'm talking about generation interval? Mm-hmm. Cubs stay with mom for up to two years, right? Which is fascinating right. because in other badger species, this they don't see this. Mm-hmm. Uh, a cub will stay with mom three, six months, right. whatnot. And researchers that are studying at least the ones in um, southern Africa basically hypothesize that part of the reason they stay with mom so long is because they have all these badass behaviors Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that they need to learn how to climb trees Mm -hmm. and dig and kill snakes and all, you know, all these really unique behaviors that make them tough that aren't, you know, they're learned, they're learned. They're They're not naturally, you don't naturally like go into a, into a, into a beehive per se. Um, nobody would really think that that's a good idea. Cause, and, and I don't know if people know this, You know, and when we get to the honeybee at some point in the next few years in this podcast, why African bees are so wait, Chris, just to back up the bus a little bit. Should we do it? I was say, I I, uh, would Ashley, your wife, want us to wait years to get to the honeybee? (laughs) I think we should do it probably in the next like soon. uh, Okay, we'll do the honeybee soon. I was just, I'm I'm trying to make big promises, but yeah, (sighs) Um, once we get settled in New Zealand and she's in her new job. You know, we'll talk about doing she the can do the honeybee She'll episode. Be, well, she's going to be one of the interviews we do. Good, I good. told her I said I'm going to interview you. The uh, oh god, so funny because if we go back and forth, I'm like, there's no way I could host this podcast with you because we'd be like each other's throats because she's so smart. Yes, She'll I can like, verify wrong, that Chris. it's probably <laughs> it's probably better for all, or people will just be cracking up <laughs> yeah. and feeling better about their yeah, lives. I guess one or the other because <laughs> she's so smart. And she's she like that's so wrong. Smart. That's yeah. wrong. Yeah. And I'd be like. Shut up, shut up. Walking encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. just smile and nod. Yeah, with you, it's like I could say something stupid. And you're like, sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> just as long as it's nice and funny. So now that I'm, I'm on the other side of Earth from Stoffel, I can call Stoffel the ultimate mommy's boy. He is the ultimate mommy's boy. They stick with mom longer than the females. Mm-hmm. The, the boys love mommy. And then when mommy starts to get frisky with another male, that's kind of signaling, hey, it's time to go. But the male, some of the studies I saw or read, the males, the female cubs, like, they're adults. They take off. They're just like, see ya. Right, they're independent. Yeah, peace out. I'm gone. You know, bye, mom. The boys, like, hanging around, like, hey, mom, hey, mom. And, like, their territory is very small. Does that sound small. like your family at all? Yeah, probably. <laughs> sounds a little bit like yeah. my family. I was like, I, I, once I was 18, I was like, peace out. Uh, it's like my, bro- uh, my brother, Joe, he he, uh, he lives near mommy still. See? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. He, and he'll listen to this someday. But anyways, the... Yeah, Stoffel and, and all the males, their their territories are really central around mom. And then over time, they get kind of pushed out and they get bigger and bigger and bigger into these huge territories we see see, to, see today. But they are the the ultimate, uh, you know, mommy boy. Well, which is, and that leads a little bit really well segment, segments into be, the behavior. And that that is kind of the only time that they're um, seen 
together. Right. They're a very solitary species mm-hmm. in general. Females are solitary. Males are solitary. They come together for a little hanky panky. Mm-hmm. And then we got another deadbeat dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that, yeah, deadbeat, dad. deadbeat dads. Well, they sh- I mean, the, well, no, they come in, they breed, and they bail. They, yeah. yeah. So, um, hey, but man, then, they, they got a lot of girls to go see. They do. They do take. They <laughs> Huge do territories. They, they do service a lot of a lot of young honey badger ladies, uh-huh. and um, so. But then, but then, like you were saying, the the mom and her cub sh- will stay together mm-hmm. for a while, and so. Researchers have shown if they sh- if they see two honey badgers together, that it's most likely a mom and even and if it go. looks big, like you said, a teenage son right. type deal. Unless they're doing the hanky panky or something, right. then that's obviously breeding. Right. But they and then in the wild, females typically don't interact, and males will, of course, they're territorial and they use um, latrines. So like mm-hmm. they're where they go to the bathroom. They use to scent mark, right. and it best basically helps tell the males, "Hey, this is my territory. Mm-hmm. You know, don't come across it." But if they do bump, the males do bump into each other. The more dominant one usually just sends a very quick signal to leave me alone, and there's they don't fight a lot. Right. Like for as well, tough, anything that bites your nuts off, I think know, they know. I, right. I would right. fight <laughs> the subordinate males. Like okay, gotcha, yeah. and just kind of like puts his head down and runs off. I so. Run off. And so, and a lot of, you know, a lot of those pheromones come out in the latrine of, like, who is the top dog, right. you know, or not dog, top badger and right. whatnot. And so, that's, you know, just not really an issue. They The male might posture, basically saying that he's the top badger. But other than that, the re- you know, a really interesting thing, too, I briefly mentioned it, is that the males can cover about 500 square kilometers right. as a territory. I read that. That's insane. Which is huge, right? square miles. I had to go backwards math. Yeah, so, and so so that's it's, that, that's nuts. That's a lot, and yeah. so it's a lot more than any other badgers that they've like been coast compared to. Coast to. In Florida, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah, we're about an hour from each. Yeah, it's about almost the width of Florida, right? And that's so, insane. and females don't. They cover about 100 to 150 right. cl- square kilometers, uh, and this is research coming out of uh, South Africa. Right. So it might different depending on where. Probably, the, I mean, know. again, and that's I guess it, it would jump into nutrition too. That it, the range is going to depend on. The diet. Yeah, and mm-hmm. density of, of mm-hmm. available foodstuffs. Right. And but so therefore and the males can circle around lots of different females. So they're polygamous. Mm-hmm. They have lots of lots of honeys. <laughs> <laughs> Even the girls I'm sure. Honey, lots of honeys. Like you mentioned, they have great smelling, great hearing, poor eyesight, but they also vocalize too as a form of communication. It's not gonna be as uh, in depth like we talked about last week with the dolphin or the vaquita. Mm-hmm. But they do make some, definitely some different noises. Mm-hmm. They say one's kind of like a ka ya 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 sound. Mm-hmm. Another one is a male will grunt during mating. Mm-hmm. And then they also whine and they can also um, scream. So if they're being, a lot of times farmers will use dogs to like sniff them mm-hmm. out, those brave dogs. Um, but if they see a dog that they, they'll scream right. and um, they'll scream like a little bear cub. So if you bear with me, I have a I have a sound, okay. and it's kind of just fun to put a sound to a, a, a face. Right. So this is a, a honey badger scream vocalization. So you. Probably don't. If you hear this sound, yeah. run. It sounds like a primate almost. You it, know? Does, it does. It yeah. does. It's. A, I don't know if it's an alarm call, but it's probably right. something similar right. to like an alarm call of like you know. It's. It's a. If you happen to be with a honey badger and you <laughs> hear this sound, yeah, I would cut my nuts. You know, run. right? Do not pass go. Do not <laughs> yeah. collect two hundred dollars or what is it? Pass go. Yeah. Collect two hundred dollars. Get the heck out of Dodge. But so yeah, they're they. Um, they definitely use a lot of vocalizations when they are together and to communicate to it uh, as one of their forms of communication. Mm-hmm. And then one of the other really neat things that I think it's not necessarily based on their behavior. I always focus each week on the animal we're talking about mm-hmm. behavior. But this is actually behaviors based on other animals mm-hmm. and, and association patterns that honey badgers, at least in southern Africa and the Kalahari region, Two mammals and five birds have been observed to be associated with right. the honey badger. Right. Honey badger. So these associations with these birds 
and mammals appear to be a form of commensalism mm -hmm. because there are other opportunistic predators and they'll target in on what the honey badger's after. Mm -hmm. So the honey badger will dig, 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 dig out some gecko. And as they're digging for what, let's just say, a lizard that mm -hmm. they're about to eat or a scorpion, they I, they have some percentages somewhere in some of the research, like 50% of the time or 60% of the time, while they're digging for something, it runs out the other way. Right. They quote unquote miss it, right? right? And that's when another mammal might come in, like a jackal, or some of these birds might swoop down mm -hmm. to get this it. to get this smaller prey. And there's also discussion of a mutualistic or mutualism behavior between the badger and a bird species mm. called a honey guide. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. And so researchers, a honey guide, they say, helps lead them to the honey. Right. And there's definitely documentation, most of it anecdotal, mm. but documentation with people of honey guides helping people find honey. Right. But the researchers go back and forth if this is really scientifically proven yeah. that the honey guide and the badger work together in work a form together of, or, not. Yeah. or not. And so they, they need further research. As far as some of these other birds, like the pale chanting uh, goosehawk or goshawk, um, that's been confirmed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's really interesting that other animals know that these guys are badasses yeah, too, yeah, right? They're family. like, you know, I'm just going to follow the honey badger. They're such amazing diggers. It's and a ama gang. You know, yeah, right? amazing like climbers. Yeah. I'm just going to go, you know, pick it up from them. I don't think there's too much stealing food from right. a honey badger because they're, well, they're so darn tough. But, you know, potentially they might be getting, you know, especially... Some of the uh, leftovers, the leftovers, like the vultures, well, I mean, if they the jackals. Try to get a Cape buffalo, a honey badger is not going to exactly get very much. Exactly, in one meal. exactly. And then so come back the next day, and I'm sure some. Yeah, I just think it's really neat. So you know, and then when we when we talk about conservation and whatnot, here's it's been shown through research that these two mammals and five birds kind of depend and On need each other, and, right. and you know needs this guy. Around guy or girl, because girls are just as tough, yeah, probably yeah, tougher. Let's be uh, let's be yeah. honest. The boys are bigger. <laughs> Darn it, that's true. The boys are much bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're much bigger. Uh, much bigger. It's uh, they have a one of the biggest examples of sexual dimorphism right. as far as males being larger than females, and that we see here in the animal kingdom or in the mammal in the carnivore family. Yes, and a lot of they need to do all this digging and climbing because. They need to eat a lot, right. and that's what I think you were looking into. This yeah, the week. nutrition. Just one last thing with behavior was I. I found this neat factoid was that they think the reason cheetah cubs can do so well or survive as well as they do is they actually resemble honey badgers. So we were talking a couple podcasts ago about cheetah cubs and the crazy Einstein hair. Mm -hmm. so that cute. Einstein hair they think makes it look like a honey badger. So people, or not people, the other animals see it and go, nope, nope. And they go the other way. <laughs> and it's just a little cheetah cub. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, I gotta, you gotta love research, I right? Know, Learning every day. So yeah, their, their territories are huge. And I thought it was interesting, some of the tracking studies that they did, that the males tend to cover about four kilometers an hour or a couple miles, two to three miles a kilometer. They're busy. Whereas the females not traveling as fast, three kilometers per hour. And then when they have a cub, you can think about that too for the females. So yeah, the females are tougher because they actually have to survive. Right, and interesting, yeah. and interestingly enough too that for their, they they sleep in dens, mm -hmm. and they don't have one home den. Right. When they when they have a newborn cub, they'll keep the same den, mm -hmm. but all the other ones that don't have cubs on their side, so the adult males and adult females. They're switching dens all the time. Right. So they're digging them out, and that's how good a digger they are. They're just like, I'll get a new home. I'll, and right. it might be a really good um, life strategy to, if you keep moving your home range, then mm -hmm. people don't necessarily, or predators don't necessarily know where you're at. Uh, but I just thought that was interesting. They're expending a lot of energy by doing right. that, too. Right. So right. Yeah. I don't moving think researchers around, really around. know why. Right. So as far as nutrition, honey badgers eat almost anything. They're, yeah, they're, they're known as a generalist carnivore, mm -hmm. which means... Anything and everything, mm -hmm. garbage, uh, you know, insects, uh, reptiles, uh, meat, anything, birds, rodents, anything, uh, male testicles. <laughs> so, so, so Rocky Mountain oysters would be uh, a favorites of theirs. Oh, yes. Yeah, they are, wow. Again, we talked about their sense of smell, so that's how really they hunt. So mm -hmm. it's not like they're ambush predators or anything, but they do, you know, like we said, dig 
for for things. So they are a predator. Absolutely, per se, yeah. That they they do eat things that are alive and 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 kill them. Obviously, they love honey because that is part of it. It's not a major part of their diet, actually. The major part of their diet, or a quarter up to half of their diet, depending on the study you look at, are these venomous snakes. Sure. So not only do they eat venomous snakes, yeah. <laughs> 20 to 50% of the time, like we have our morning cup of coffee, right. they have a venomous snake. Right. I mean, if, yeah. if, you know, if, it, if the half numbers the are as high yeah. as 50%. Yeah, at least a quarter, if not up to 50% mm -hmm. of the time, they eat venomous snakes, puff adders, cobras. And again, this is where... They're mostly studied in Sub-Sahara Africa. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier to study them there because they are smaller. But yeah, they eat. They they love their snakes, and so well. And also, nobody else is really going for snakes, so it gives them kind of a neat niche. Right, right. So it's kind of, and that's again when we talk about balance of nature. You know, they are the check to more venomous, you know, less venomous snakes. If less honey badgers, maybe you get more venomous snakes. You know. Well, that, and I think another kind of pro honey badger thought out there is since they are able to deal with this very powerful venom mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can get into the physiology a little mm -hmm. bit of that in a minute, but there's potential of trying to figure out some of these mechanisms for anti-venom purposes. Right. That's yeah. To, when, save, yeah. to actually save right. people. A lot of people die each year from, in some of, um, in some of these countries from venomous snake right. bites. And so if we had better anti-venoms, more available mm -hmm. ones, if there's something physiologically we can learn and gather from the honey badger, we don't want them to go extinct right. or we don't, you know, we, right. we can use their badassness to save lives. To, to benefit us. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting when you look at the, uh, how they survive this, these venomous bites, it's really, they have special properties in their blood. So again, that's something as a scientist, we could probably isolate. I'm sure somebody might be studying it. I don't know. I don't want to try to draw blood from a honey badger, but... Negative ghost rider. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun at that knockdown. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, um, interesting, hedgehogs, mongoose, and even pigs. So the one study I was reading talking about how they can withstand venom. Right. I, I found fascinating yeah. i knew mongooses and whatnot yeah. i didn't know really know about hedgehogs or pigs and pigs yeah pigs have some special properties that they also too not quite as well as the, the honey badger so chris how does this work no so they the the study i was looking at is they it really there's a disruption in the receptors so normal venom would bind and that would end up killing you whereas in that doesn't happen in in the honey badgers or some of the other species that they've looked at. Yeah, it was really interesting. One of the, the more recent research projects I was reading about, because there's a lot of other mechanisms too, and there's a lot of proteins mm -hmm. that are the problem yeah. in this venom. Analytical chemistry, your favorite <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I love proteins uh, and small things I can't see. Yeah. And so one of the more uh, recent studies was showing, uh, like you said, about the receptors, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. the, the neurotoxin from the venom doesn't fit into the the back. lock and key. Right, go back right. To the that. lock and yeah. key don't um, match. Don't match. And so I'm glad that you brought that up because it's being it's been described by some researchers as an arms race mm -hmm. between the snake venom becoming more poisonous mm -hmm. to harm, of course, these honey badgers, and then the honey badgers evolving their receptors to once again not let the venom fit right. in there. And, and, and so yeah. it's going, it just keeps going back and right. forth and back and forth of who's going to win this quote unquote venom's arm, arm race. And I guess that to tie it into to conservation again, that's why genetic diversity is so important because mm -hmm. when you lose that genetic diversity, you know, it can take out a whole sure. population. And a bottleneck species, right. which then that's, you know, or um, in a bottleneck population, that's, you know, that's what you worry about mm -hmm. that the, if they're forced to live in this one little area right. or something that that might one be a problem. One thing can wipe them all mm -hmm. out. Right. So let's talk about repro, birds and the bees, the honey badger. <laughs> they love bees. <laughs> so yeah, the birds and the bees with the honey badger is, you know, not not too many um, wild stories here mm -hmm. like we've had with some of the other yeah. species. Just that the male is promiscuous and a polygonous, mm -hmm. so, and that they don't have a breeding season per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see that cubs are born year-round, year round, yeah. probably because they can... They are not based on seasonality of grasses mm. or like a lot of herbivores are waiting for the rains to have their their um, their offspring. These guys, Beat clearly anything. they're so badass. They're yeah. just like, we can have babies eat whenever any, we yeah. want. We, <laughs> eat we, 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 we eat want. anything we want and therefore we're, yeah. you know, yeah. ha, you know, expend our energy however we want. And so 
Uh, but yeah, like I mentioned before, my Ma, mom and dad meet up. Usually uh, we do know a little bit about the female reproductive mm-hmm. system. Um, not as much as I would like to know because right. I'm a dork like that. But that the females are induced ovulators. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that's similar mm-hmm. to like the, the cats mm-hmm. that we talk mm-hmm. about. And, and they think that this too, that's, you know, not 100% sure, but from yeah. what, from from basic studies and what the induced ovulator means is that they actually have to be bred or there has to be penetration to help trigger ovulation. And I think it kind of goes back to about what we talked about, not many of them in captivity. So it's really hard to sure. study this stuff. Exactly, Chris. Yeah. Like, I mean, most of these studies we're talking that I've, we, you and I have been referencing yeah. are, are these observations, are these wild. observation of photographers and researchers right. wearing cups right. <laughs> hiding in trees and, <laughs> and hiding behind trees right. and hope, you know, and, and watching these guys, which is the coolest job for the yeah, minus, minus the I cup know. part is a super cool job. I've got to observe a lot amazing. of wildlife, so, but in the it, same instance, yeah, we're not able to get in there with an ultrasound. Right. Like and do. it's just, you know, it, 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 which obviously there's so many species, you know, over 7 million species of different wild life on earth, you know, in the seas and then on land. So we can't know everything about all of them, but no. still, when you're talking about a mammal that we may have to save from the wild one day. Mm-hmm. So as a scientist, I'm like, man, what if I had was tasked with saving the honey badger? How do I know the reproduction? So where do I start? Exactly. Yeah, you know, and I think what we do know is similar to cats is the females do come into an estrus. So they mm-hmm. are. It's not like a male just grabs any Comes female. Over, yeah. yeah, he the, the female sending signs through most likely through her urine, through mm-hmm. her latrines, and, and probably some behavioral... Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't find too many behavioral estrus signs right. and, and honey badgers. But she's so she's somehow telling them she's, you know, good Ready, to go, yeah. hot hot to trot, if you will. She's got to kick the, the boy out. He's just, right. The, the teenager, the teenagers got to go. playing video games. Mm-hmm. Get out of here, bro. Got to go. Yeah. It's, the adults need some alone time. Uh, boy, I can relate to that, right? Yeah. Um, but then this is kind of interesting and uh, I don't know just for some reason fits my stereotype of these honey badgers is when it is when the female is giving signals and they do start the the breeding or courtship slash right. breeding process he base the male basically um, forces the female into his a den right and keeps her there for three days <laughs> she's stuck there at least this is how researchers describe yeah, yeah. it right maybe she's they're maybe there. maybe they're being a little dramatic yeah. but she's forced to stay in there and, and being an induced ovulator, you do need to get bred a lot right. because the first time you get bred, that just stimu- helps stimulate mm-hmm. your body to ovulate. But you need what I call yeah. reinforcement breedings mm-hmm. to kind of then actually, you know, make the magic happen. Yeah. And so I guess by, ho- you know, locking her or holding her up in a den. He's make sure it's, it's his he's genetics. Making, yeah, making yeah. sure it's his genetics. And then when the female is pregnant, she actually has a pretty short gestation mm-hmm. uh, period, uh, six six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. That's okay, so right. that's not too long. And they uh, don't usually have more than one to two cubs at right. a time. And so, you know, not, a, you know, not, a, they're, they're investing their, right. yeah, I think they invest their time in the one or two because they have a lot of training yeah, to yeah, do and whatnot. Yeah, and then, like you had mentioned, they have, you know, high mortality rate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, there's not lots and lots of honey badgers, badgers being all born all the time yeah. um they're not like rabbits no no definitely not like rabbits and then some other breeding behaviors are do they'll do is some they'll do some jaw smacking mm-hmm. that will be used by um, females and males together when they're together and interestingly enough too about the cub when it's born it's born naked and blind mm. So they, you know, that's where mom does have to spend a lot of time caring mm-hmm. for it and, you know, helping it grow. Right. And the mom will t- typically move the cub to like a new den every two to five days. Mm. So once again, there's just this, you know, there's a lot of work and, right. and she'll carry the cub in her mouth and then move it along. And then the cub's eyes usually open after about two months and then emerges wow, from the that's di- that long. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's yeah. a lot of yeah, that's a lot of caretaking for such a small mammal. Mm-hmm. And of course no dad around. So oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but then at about uh, a little after two months, around three months or so, the um the cub starts to follow mom around and start learning the hunting. Right. But once again, it's this cub stays with the mom up to fourteen months, which is much much longer than the, like the Eurasian badger, which has been pretty intensively studied. Mm-hmm. And they think once again, this is to learn all the badassness things to be a honey badger. Mm-hmm. It takes a while. You don't just you just don't learn that in a few days, right? right? right. You gotta you gotta learn how to wreck mayhem over multiple months. So yeah, I think it's tricky. You know, like okay, how do I survive a strike, a bee strike? Right. So you know. And I don't know if I got to finish my bee story. 
about the difference between African and European honeybees that the African bees, when, so European honeybees, a hive gets attacked, about 30% of the hive will come out to defend it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's nasty, sure. but it's not the entire hive. With African hives, it's almost like 80% of the hive oh. empties. That's why they're like so much more aggressive because their so warm pheromone goes out and just they swarm. Mm -hmm. So honey badgers can survive. They've, they've saw one up to the thousand bee stings, you mm -hmm. know, again, that thick coats, but there have been instances of honey badgers being stung to death too. So they're not impenetrable. Right. Right. So they, again, they are tough, but not invincible. So how can we support honey badgers, Angie? What can we do? Well, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, once again, currently, you're not going to hear a lot about them being endangered and whatnot, but we do we do know that their population is declining. Mm -hmm. And this is for some of the re similar themes that we've talked about mm -hmm. in other episodes, but they are often sought after for their body parts, mm -hmm. um, their paws, their skin, their fat, their organs. They're commonly used in traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's this is once again because of their reputation of being fearless right. and um, and being tenacious mm -hmm. and whatnot. People, I guess, think if they consume these parts, uh, that they will get also the power get that. Or um, on, which be so beyond that as a species. It's such BS, right? Yeah, we, that's we know five thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. But then a more at home issue, especially um, for the what's been studied in South in Southern Africa, is they are. Uh, prized bushmeat too mm -hmm. yeah and but you know the bushmeat uh crisis is tough because a lot of the a lot of the the people that live in the area i mean they should be able to eat hunt, the animals yeah, and hunt and whatnot yeah. mm -hmm. and so that's a really you know that that's a really complex issue that uh, i think different countries are working to resolve in different ways uh, and in a couple countries the honey badger has been uh listed as cites appendix three mm -hmm. in botswana and ghana and what that Appendix 3 basically just says that we need to start observing their trade and it has right. to be, the trade has to be, you need permits right. and certifications to, in order to do that. But the cool thing about Botswana and Ghana doing this is it sends a message to other countries that, you know, maybe we should get on board too right. and do this. Right. And so, I th you know, that's, I applaud them very much so. And hopefully, you know, they're they're recognizing their popula population is declining, mm -hmm. that we should do something about it. Right. Or they hit the mm -hmm. crisis standpoint, yeah. And we touched on a little bit earlier, but the, probably the, they're most often persecuted through either poisons mm -hmm. or through steel jaw traps by beekeepers and small mm -hmm. livestock farmers. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that is work in progress uh, of how and it's one of the big problems i think with wildlife is wildlife human conflict you know it's not just in africa like we we talked about with snow leopards in nepal and mongolia no we have pro the problems out here west with wolves and you know and cattle ranchers, and cattle ranchers. Right. so it's, it, it's it's everywhere and there's there's no one fits all solution right. um but it's definitely you know poisoning you know that's kind of rough like mm -hmm. nobody wants to uh to, you know, to do, I know, I know. to do that. Uh, and so my, one of my organizations of the week is actually focusing on that and mm -hmm. it's a really feel good story. Mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and picked endangered wildlife trust. So you can go to www.ewt.org.za. And what this is, uh, is the carnivore conservation group of the endangered wildlife trust basically set up what they call the Badger Friendly Initiative. All right. Okay. And this is charming because yeah. this is such a clever a clever way. Right. And this is lots of, you know, ingenious people from probably different backgrounds and different um, socioeconomic status coming together and being like, how can we, you know, how can we help this relationship mm -hmm. between the beekeepers, farmers, and honey badgers? And so what they did is they created kind of like workshops and you know, websites and all these kind of different strategies to inform and assist beekeepers on a one-to-one -one basis on how to protect their hives. Mm -hmm. And they also went out and educated the public about honey badgers, and they wanted to do uh, increase positive in initiatives for mm -hmm. for badgers. And so this this picked up some speed and some trends, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we sometimes see with pop culture. Right, like, right. You know, one person hears about it. And, and with that, some of the public said, yeah, 
Hell yeah. yeah. You know what? We you know, we love honey, yeah. but we don't want honey if the bee farmers poisoning killing these, these honey badgers. Hun- yeah. Killing these honey badgers. So then there was a whole movement by this group uh, to basically they have a nationally recognized accreditation mm-hmm. and sticker to mark things as badger friendly logos. Yeah, so it's on, not honey on their badger products. free. <laughs> it's not only badger free, right? It, um, but that's, it's it's friendly. Yeah, that's, and, that's great. And saying that these beekeepers and farmers, people, yeah. you know, whatnot have have like either taken classes mm-hmm. or workshops, and they have a whole website that that shows people mm-hmm. how to keep. Badgers like Stoffel. Yeah, you know somebody's done the science behind yeah. it of how to how to how to keep these hives 100 percent honey badger free, free and yeah. then then they can fetch a higher price for their honey right. from from locally informed public. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, anyways, if you go there um, and give you know donate them or tell them they're doing a good job, um, I'm really you know proud that the Nature Wildlife Trust they they do a lot of different species right, work, right. Uh, but they recognize that the the honey badger is not endangered yet like some of the other species they. They spot. They do a spotlight on, but that they there is a need for this, right. and that consumers want this. Right, right. They do, and they and, and, do. and yeah. it was all formed through education, which right. is a, a common theme that you and I talk about a lot. Mm-hmm. As far as um, it's amazing what how economical or economics plays into this, and people how, people vote with their dollar. dollar right, that's what you've been and saying. My so husband and I, we try to do that right. all the time, and really, you know, vote with our dollar. You might. Not think it makes a difference, yeah. but it does. It does. Oh, it makes a huge difference. You know? Oh yeah, it makes a huge, huge difference. And then my just lastly too, it's kind of cute. My um, second organization is if you want to for Christmas, you can go to the World Wildlife Fund, mm. which I've highlighted before on this series. But they have um, you can either adopt um, a honey badger kit, right? And you get like a gift of the little stuffed right, animal right, right. and all this little fun facts and stuff. So that's a cute little present mm-hmm. for any of you honey badger fans out there. But other 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 than that, they also have uh, the ability to adopt a virtual virtual honey, honey badger. badger. <laughs> so I don't, you know, so it's a little cheaper, and I don't, you know, but it I won't thought, chase me well. <laughs> Sure, but I thought that might be a good one for you know for our boys yeah, this Christmas know, or something. So I don't know what exactly that entails because I haven't done it. But I'm trying to think of who that would be the best yeah, gift for this this, uh, this holiday season. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I, I can think of so many funny honey badger shirts I can come up with right now that I can make. I know, seriously, <laughs> they, nuts. Uh, yeah. that's the whole title. This is protect your nuts, the honey badger. S- seriously, <laughs> I mean they are they are nasty. They are they're in great. a wonderful way because yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They're doing what, great because they've been able to adapt to what mankind. Intended for, mm-hmm. right? That's what they've mm-hmm. evolved into. And but they're not as tough as they are. They're not invincible. Yes, at least and, they're not a size of a horse. Right, and they're not a size of a horse. <laughs> and, and so that's why we're here today talking about them to, to talk about all their cool facts right. and their physiology, mm-hmm. and that they are mostly invincible, yeah. but not entirely invincible. Right. And so we still gotta, you know, even though we're tough and they're tough and we're scared of them, they yeah. there's a lot of good that they do right. and uh and they're really unique creatures and we we we've got to be their voice too. Right. We do, we do. And you know, our calls for action this week, if you are really enjoying the podcast, you know, you can subscribe, you can go to our Patreon page. It's linked on our website, allcreaturespod.com. You can subscribe. You don't have to be a paying member, but you can at least subscribe and then you'll get an email when we release an episode or when we post some content that you'll be notified. It'll so. get you excited about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe I'll come up with that Honey Badger shirt protect your nuts or something. <laughs> I'll get my friend who's an artist to design something. But, you know, thank you for uh, subscribing. And please give us feedback again. We say this every episode. Yes, and thank you for listening. Yeah, and We'll see you next episode. All right. Have a good one. Right. Bye. Listen. Learn. Share. Join the movie.